Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, What Will Rural Housing Funding Be in 2018? My name is Shantaria Charleston, and I will be the moderator and host for today's call. If you've not already done so, please ensure that you have access to both the audio and video portion of the webinar. To access the PowerPoint for today's call, please follow the link on your meeting confirmation email. All participants are in listen-only mode, which means your line is muted. However, we are very interested in your questions as well as your feedback, so to submit a question during today's presentation, please use the Q&A box that will appear on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Again, today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and presentation will be available on HACS website www.ruralhome.org shortly following the webinar. So there are a few uh, familiar names on the webinar today, but for those of you that are not familiar with the Housing Assistance Council, the Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that assists local organizations with building affordable homes in rural America. With the mission to improve housing conditions for the rural poor, HAC places an emphasis on striving to serve the poorest of the poor in the most rural places. HAC emphasizes local solutions, Empowerment of the Poor, Reduced Dependence, and Self-Help Strategies. HACC assists with the development of both single and multifamily homes and promotes home ownership for working, low-income rural families through a self-help, sweat equity construction method. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about HACC services or products, HACC has an office near you. If you have questions or require assistance, please contact your nearest HAC regional office. Those office uh, locations as well as the contact information are currently being displayed on the screen. It will also be a part of the information that's posted to the website following the webinar. Again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. What will rural housing funding be in 2018? I'd like to quickly turn things over to our speakers for today's webinar. Leslie Strauss, she is HACS Senior Policy Analyst, as well as Stephen Sugg, he's HACS Government Relations Manager. Stephen, Leslie? Thank you, Terry. Thanks for those who've joined us, too. Uh, Leslie's going to jump into the USDA side of the budget uh, here very shortly, but before we do that, we're eager to show just a little bit of context about the federal budget process. We heard we often hear terms like sequestration, dead on arrival, appropriations bills, budget, budget committee, appropriations committee, and all these things. And for those of us who live inside the Beltway, these are, these are pretty much our language of everyday life. But for those of you who are lucky enough to uh, do real work outside of the Beltway, we want to spend just a minute or two giving a very broad overview of the budget and the process and also the Budget Control Act, which kind of controls a lot of this right now, except for when Congress decides that doesn't apply. But anyway, for the budget process, every year the president proposes a budget. And last year, it was President Obama's last year. We heard that budget was dead on arrival. This year, a lot of members of Congress have said this budget's dead on arrival. You know, Congress controls the power of the purse. The Constitution says that. But if that's the case, why do we spend time digging into the president's budget? And the real reason is there, it's, it's a... It's a statement of administration priorities. The budget has lots of numbers, program funding levels, agency funding levels, but the budget's also a long-term statement of priorities, of things the government wants to invest in, uh, not invest in. It can also be a template for future legislation. So the budget is a lot of things beyond a bunch of numbers. And secondly, yes, Congress does have the power of the purse. Congress does write the appropriations bills, but the president has something called a veto pen. And very recently, President Trump said he wouldn't mind another government shutdown. And so the president in any party definitely has leverage throughout the budget and appropriations processes. So this document is worth looking at in that regard. Uh, throughout the process, every year, the House, uh, by, by order of the Constitution, originates funding bills. And that means the appropriations process. And then usually in most years, um, Congress, or in some years, I should say, Congress has what's called a budget resolution and that's really kind of, the budget committee kind of has a big pie, then they divide it up in these things called 302B allocations in a normal year. And that tells each appropriations subcommittee, like agriculture, 
and other subcommittees how much money they have to spend each year. In reality, it's a lot messier than that. But then within the appropriations uh, bills, we have the um, subcommittee on agriculture appropriations committee. Then we have an appropriations committee that funds transportation HUD and other agencies. And you see uh, commerce justice, you know, you have uh, education subcommittees. So um, you have these appropriations subcommittees, which essentially write the bills, which eventually go into laws. And that's how it works. It goes through the House and Senate. It gets uh, hammered out and eventually goes to the president's desk. That's all in the textbooks. In reality, in recent years, you often see things called continuing resolutions. That's because the end of the fiscal year comes along. Congress hasn't gotten it together, so to speak. They haven't agreed on many of the bills, and they operate basically on standby mode just to keep the fund government funded at the uh, status quo until they can reach an agreement, which uh, not too long ago they reached an FY17 agreement, which should have happened back in September, but it didn't. And so that's what often happens, especially when uh, Democrats and Republicans aren't getting along on Capitol Hill. So that's a little bit about the process. And if folks have deeper questions about that, we can go into it later, or I can send some um, materials out after that. We also hear a lot about the Budget Control Act. And the Budget Control Act, back in the good old days, the 2011 or so, uh, then, Speaker, then Speaker Boehner and uh, President Obama, um, <laughs> here I go again. Speaker Boehner and President Obama and the Congress back then reached what was called the Budget Control Act, and that's a 10-year uh, piece, of, piece of legislation, you might call it, and that set uh, caps, discretionary caps on spending between defense and non-defense. We've heard terms like parity between defense and non-defense, sequestration that kicks in if Congress can't reach the spending limits, et cetera. And in, in FY16 and FY17, these caps were raised so Congress could essentially spend more money than the 2011 Budget Control Act called for, and the politics behind that is essentially that a lot of, uh, you might call them defense hawks, oftentimes Republicans want to spend more money than the budget control elect, uh, allows on defense. And a lot of the Democrats want to spend more money on domestic priorities. And they often join forces so they can write bigger, check, bigger checks. And that's kind of how they raise the cap, so to speak. We often hear terms about um, parity between defense and non-defense spending. And that's essentially what they're talking about there. And the other quick point before I get to Leslie is, is that we're talking about discretionary spending, which is give or take a third or fourth of the federal budget, where the real money is, so to speak, which we don't talk about as much in this case, is called the uh, mandatory budget. And that's, that's money that's not subject to the annual appropriations process. That could be Medicaid spending, Social Security, lots of other things like that. And that's where a lot more of the money is, although a lot of the noise in housing and other circles is around domestic spending. And discretionary spending is pretty much evenly split between defense and non-defense, defense, roughly speaking, every year. So hopefully that's an overview. And now I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Leslie. Thanks, Stephen. The proposal to reorganize USDA is not part of the budget. And in fact, it was not included in the budget because the budget documents were finished before this proposal was put out. Um, the, Proposal was released two weeks ago. The budget was released two days ago, but the budget was in preparation for a long time before that. Um, but I want to say a little bit about the reorganization proposal because it's got to have some connection to the budget, um, even if we're not entirely clear how they're going to work together. It would create a new Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs which is required by the 2014 Farm Bill. In the process of reorganizing to get that together, it would create also another new undersecretary for farm production and conservation, and it would eliminate the undersecretary for rural development, who is currently the person in between the um, secretary, Sonny Perdue, and the administrators of the Rural Business Service, Rural Housing Service, and Rural Utilities Service. That's the position that was held most recently by Lisa Mensa, if that name means something to people. Um, it has not been filled. There, nobody has been um, nominated to fill that position for the Trump administration so far. The um, position of Undersecretary for Rural Development would be it. The, the substitute for that would be an assistant secretary. 
Sonny Perdue has described this in a couple of hearings, including one yesterday on the budget, as a person, the Assistant Secretary is a person who has walk-in privileges to his office, to Perdue's office, and he's called this an elevation of rural development. It's kind of hard not to see it as a demotion of rural development, however, especially when you combine it with the cuts in the budget. Um, the Well, it's tempting to jump ahead, but um, before I start summarizing the budget cuts, the, the administration is accepting comments on the reorganization proposal. Um, you can submit, there's a couple different ways to submit them, but you can go to regulations.gov and search for um, whatever term is appropriate, uh, USDA reorganization, I guess. Um, and comments are due on June 14th. TAC is going to comment, and we will try to get our comments posted on our website a few days before the 14th so that they can be helpful if anybody wants to use them to do your own. I can't guarantee that that's going to happen. Stephen, can you go to the next slide? Certainly. Sorry, Stephen has the mouse. Um, this is just a quick overview of what USDA's single family programs are. Most of you, <laughs> now I have the mouse, most of you probably know um, the programs if you don't um, you may want to go back and look at this later. To, okay. And, okay. I see why we're having trouble advancing slides. There we go. Um, single, USDA single family housing programs also include um, the self-help program, Sweat Equity, which is funded through Section 523, that's the money that goes to the organizations that sponsor the self-help housing projects. Um, this is what the budget proposes. A couple of important zeros. Um, basically, the budget is the culmination of a years-long trend to focus on guaranteed lending rather than direct lending because that costs the government less. It also, because it's not as deeply subsidized, doesn't reach people with as low incomes as the direct loans do. So they propose to keep the single family, and then you'll see this in a minute for rental, they're doing the same thing, proposing to keep the guarantee program and do away with the direct lending programs and for the self-help program, there's apparently $11 million not obligated yet from um, fiscal 11 or 17, sorry. And the budget proposes to rescind that money. So not only do you not get new money for self-help and a couple of other things that we'll get to in a minute, but you lose um, past money that hasn't been used yet but could still be used because we've got some of the year remaining. The 504 grant program, which goes along with the 504 loan program, is one of four programs that are proposed to go into what they're calling a rural economic infrastructure grant program. So apparently this is how we get to the administration's um, Great plans to improve infrastructure. We take existing programs and put the label infrastructure on them. This would combine four RD programs, Section 504 Home Repair Grants, Community Facilities Grants, Telemedicine Distance Learning Grants, and Broadband Grants. In fiscal 17, those four programs got a total of $133.6 million. The budget would give them a little bit more than that, $162 million, but it also would add an earmark that none of them had before, earmarking $80 million, that's almost half, for Appalachia. I don't doubt that Appalachia needs that much money and more for these things, but it's really not clear 
why Appalachia specifically and why no other high needs areas are mentioned. Um, there's no mention of uh, promise zones, economic um, empowerment zones, the kinds of uh, broader based things that the past couple of administrations have created to target money to where it's most needed. I knew that was going to happen. Sorry. Okay. Um, then USDA has a set of multifamily programs. These are um, obviously for renters. As I said, they're doing the same thing in the multifamily programs as in the single family. If we can get to it. There we go. And zeroing out um, the direct loan programs, that's 515 and 514, also zeroing out the 516 grant program that goes with 514 loans, those are farm worker housing, and focusing on and slightly increasing the Section 538 program, which guarantees loans that are made by private lenders. The negative four in parentheses that's kind of floating in between the lines for 514 and 516 is because it's another rescission that's proposed that takes money um, from the, the general pool that funds both of those programs. Rental assistance is a crucial program um, in USDA's multifamily arsenal. This looks like a reduction in rental assistance, but get to the next slide. Um, we see part of the fiscal 17 appropriation, the 1.4 billion, was a $40 million advance to be used in fiscal 18, which essentially should move $40 million from the 17 column into the 18 column, in which case you would have um, a slight increase in rental assistance funding from 17 to 18. As far as I know, this lowered amount in 17, the amount that's actually available in 17, is in fact enough to renew all existing contracts. The budget says that the fiscal 18 rental assistance amount they gave, which amounts to 1.385 billion, is enough to renew all existing contracts. They do specifically say that it's it's all going to existing contracts. They're not intending to provide any new rental assistance. Um, but hopefully it is at least enough to keep all existing tenants um, covered. There specifically mentioned the absence of a minimum rent provision because the Obama administration in a couple of budgets proposed imposing a minimum rent on USDA tenants, we were, um, HAC and various other organizations, opposed to that idea. Some of these tenants have incredibly low income. Some of them have no income. There is a proposal in this year's budget to require minimum rents from HUD tenants, but not from USDA. So don't tell the administration that we noticed this, because we don't want them to notice it. Um, then there are a couple of other um, rental programs that are used for rental preservation. Both the Bush and Obama administrations, um, USDAs, were very concerned about preserving rental housing against um, various threats, possible things that can take rental preservation out of the rent, uh, can take rental housing, sorry, out of the rental stock. Those include um, prepayment of loans, maturing loans. A lot of the um, USDA Section 515 loans are getting to the end of their terms and just naturally are expiring because the properties have been around for so long. And uh, physical 
maintenance needs, a lot of maintenance debt deferred, and so a lot of properties, even if the owner doesn't want to leave the program, the owner um, often needs additional funding to preserve the property physically. However, the Trump administration does not seem as concerned about preservation as its predecessors were. It's, there's a rescission again for the NPR preservation program that would take away $4 million that hasn't been used yet. The preservation revolving loan fund was not funded the last couple of years either. It is revolving loans, so the money that's out there that's being used by intermediaries, HEC is one of them, full disclosure, um, intermediaries get the PRLF money and then reloan it to uh, property owners or buy purchasers. Um, there, so the money is still circulating because it is a revolving fund and gets used again for the same purposes when it gets paid back, but it could still be, additional money could still be used if there were some. 542 vouchers go to tenants in properties that were prepaid, 515 properties where the mortgages were prepaid. The $20 million, I'm not sure if that's enough to cover. Again, it, it probably renews existing vouchers, which are for one year and then need to be renewed every year. I'm not sure whether it, um, whether this dollar amount would account for additional um, tenants that may need voucher funds in fiscal 18. And now we're going to switch to HUD and I'm gonna turn it back to Stephen. Thanks, Leslie. And looking at the audience in this call, I think that we're, we're, we'll go into more detail on the USDA side. So on the HUD side, I'll be a little bit more general and I'll refer folks to, um, after the call. If folks wanna email me, with any more specifics or ask questions, but I'll probably go a little faster on the HUD side. Um, but one big note to keep, it's a HUD, the, the cut to HUD is 15%. Uh, for perspective, the proposed cut to the entire USDA, which includes rural water, sewer, housing, farm subsidies, and other programs as well, is 21%. A lot of agencies from the Department of Labor, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, all have proposed cuts, 10, 15, 20% range. The only agencies that did better on the president's budget in last year, you might say, are Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security, and the Department of Defense. And so that's kind of where we, a uh, little bit of context there. For HUD, there's a lot of cuts, but the bulk of that 15% is the elimination of the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and the HOME program. And I think most of you are familiar with both those programs. CDBG is very flexible money could be used for housing production, rural infrastructure, urban infrastructure, et cetera. Um, the home funding basically helps make the cost of affordable housing lower in rural and urban areas. And both those programs from their peak levels years ago have had downward spirals under uh, previous administrations, previous Congresses. But this is a time that uh, both programs be eliminated. Folks have asked me, you know, why does the administration want to eliminate these programs? And from their budget statement, it, said, it, it says, it, uh, the budget recognizes a greater role for state and local governments in the private sector in addressing community development and affordable housing. And they also point sometimes that these programs are duplicative. So that's where the administration is coming from there. Um, another big part of the budget, uh, Secretary Carson, recent media appearances, has said affordable housing is too cozy. He said that in the New York Times. And he also recently, I guess it was yesterday, called poverty a state of mind. And so it's just a different philosophy on, around these issues. The budget also eliminates the housing trust fund, which a lot of uh, advocates for the very low income folks have been fighting for for a number of years. That's basically paid for by a little bit of a fee on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And uh, that money goes to affordable housing distributed to all the states. And this, this budget would take that money and basically put it back into HUD salaries and expenses and eliminate that subsidy there. Um, as Leslie talked about in the USDA budget, the HUD budget also includes policy changes around minimum rents and work eligibility. And Secretary Carson and uh, OMB Director Mulvaney have talked about that a lot, that they want folks to be working, able-bodied folks to be working. Advocates have said that's already happening pretty much, but that's kind of the different lines of uh, agreement or disagreement there. And so Secretary Carson finally said, this is fiscal responsibility. We want to protect the most vulnerable 
and pursue new approaches to achieve self-sufficiency. So that's a little bit of context for the HUD budget. And a couple of programs, I'm not going to go through every detail here, but on tenant-based rental assistance, uh, goes from 19, uh, the slight cut proposed, the National Income Housing Coalition and other organizations have said with, when you factor in inflation and other things, this is actually a cut that would put um, hundreds of thousands of people possibly on the streets. So uh, advocates for housing said this is probably not enough even to renew existing, existing things there. For project-based rental assistance, obviously uh, a, a little bit of a cut there as well. Uh, public housing, the folks that uh, have long pointed out to a need for public housing funding, uh, capital funding, and it's uh, vastly underfunded according to a lot of advocates. And here's another big cut to that. And we'll mention elsewhere that HUD programs, public housing authorities also exist in rural areas. Happened to study that a few years back. When we talk about these HUD programs, these also occur in rural. It's really important to, to note that. Okay, and we'll, okay, we'll go back, that's fine. Uh, Choice Neighborhood, that's a program that uh, President Obama really championed, got zeroed out. Ended housing block grants got a, got a reduction. The housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, homeless assistance, those are some programs that are taking cuts that are smaller than CDBG and homes cuts, obviously, but they are still cuts, especially when you factor in inflation and population growth. And as we keep going through these programs, uh, you'll see them. I'll hold them up very quickly. Um, Section 202, Elderly and Housing for the Disabled. And those programs receive cuts as well. Um, we're going to a few more programs at HUD that a lot of the folks in this call I know care about a lot. The Section 4 program, which uh, LISC and Enterprise Intermediaries and Habitat for Humanity kind of all split to provide capacity building for urban and rural areas. That was proposed for elimination. The Rural Capacity Building, RCB, it's about a $5 million program that HAC and a few other organizations use each year to bring capacity to rural areas. That's slated for elimination. And the SHOP program, which many folks are familiar with, it allows, uh, it basically subsidizes self-help housing with uh, land and infrastructure costs, which are hard to come by. And that program is also eliminated to HAC and Habitat for Humanity and a few other organizations across the country have received shop funds for about 21 years. There's also a couple other small programs, the Rural Innovation Fund and the Rural Housing and Economic Development Program, which in previous years, going back quite a ways, folks have put that in the HUD budget just to keep HUD, HUD's hands in the rural areas and towards rural needs, which are our unique HAC believes. Okay, uh, as I wait for my, okay. And some other budget context there. The budget eliminates the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Delta Regional Commission, Northern Borders, Borders Regional Commission, and rural lawmakers from both sides of the aisles, most notably uh, Congressman Hal Rogers, the former chairman of the Appropriations Committee, have noted some serious concerns about that. Um, even Secretary Perdue at one of the recent hearings talked about how he used to be the chairman of the Appalachian Regional Commission and how he thought it was a good program. So. I think that those, they have some substantial support in Congress. And low-income advocates, especially housing folks and others, believe that the cuts across agencies, from food stamps to domestic violence spending uh, to education programs, they really combine together to hurt the rural poor. So they're not just looking at this by agency by agency numbers. They're looking at all these cuts come together and really cut at the safety net. The administration believes that this money will rein in spending and unleash economic growth and thereby benefit low-income people. Secretary Perdue at a hearing yesterday said that a job is the best anti-poverty program, something along those lines. So, you know, if they can get jobs to these folks, that's really the top concern. Um, administration suggests greater role for state and local governments in adjusting community development and affordable housing. And that's a trend throughout the HUD budget that, that they really want other folks, aside from the federal government, to take on responsibility for a lot of these, these needs. And that about sums it up for the hack, for, excuse me, for the HUD front. Um, we're going to briefly mention hack, hacks services on the end of the call. I think both, most of you are pretty aware of that. And with, just in, at the beginning, Carrie described what hack does. Also. Yes, so we'll, we'll keep, keep moving on from there. And um, hopefully we hit some of the highlights there. And Leslie, do you have any concluding comments on, on the budget? Um, I just 
to point out that the budget process that Stephen described at the beginning of this presentation uh, still has to be gone through. So there are still places where we can influence what the end result actually is. And this is a budget that needs to have a different end result. So we can take questions, Terry. All right, great. We have just a few questions that have come in. Um, Folks, if you are out there and you have these questions percolating to the top, go ahead and chat those in to us in the Q&A box. And so the first question is actually from Jill out at InCall, and she wants to know, can they rescind 523 money now, or do they have to wait until the end of the fiscal year to see if there really is money left over? They would... They, have, they can't take it away now because um, this hasn't passed yet. This is just a proposal. So it would have to be money that's actually available. And they can't take money that's already been given out to groups. They have to take money that hasn't been obligated yet. I assume, however, that if USDA thought that this budget was going to pass in its current form, that they could hold off on actually obligating money for self-help and the other programs where rescissions are proposed so that they would have that amount left. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the second question is from Michelle out at Turtle Mountain. And I think, Stephen, this might be a question for you. She wants to know, uh, do these and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong here. Do these um, include ICDBG? Yes, I, this is Leslie. ICDBG would be zeroed out also, unfortunately. OK. Um, we've got a question from Jeff. He wants to know if Congress defunds HUD and I'm sorry, if, if Congress defines home in CDBG, as well as other funds that include loan obligations, what happens to the debt payment? I'm sorry, Terry, I didn't hear the end of that. What happens to what? To the debt payment. The federal debt or payments on debts going to HUD? The, the, the debt payments on home and CDBG projects. They, HUD would still be there collecting money. Um, and this applies in, in other places as well, the USDA loan programs that would be zeroed out and the rural business programs would be canceled completely. All of the programs administered by the Rural Business Service but the Rural Business Service debt collection functions would still exist, and so would HUD's, and so would the Rural Housing Service. Um, Uncle Sam would still get his money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that um, the, the uh, I want to say infrastructure, that may not be the right word, the, the staff capacity to collect on outstanding loans will still exist. All right, thank you. We um, have a question from Marty out at ORF. He wants to know, is the proposed fiscal year 18 budget impacting how and when agencies release fiscal year 17 funds? I don't think so. I may be missing something about the question. You haven't heard anything to that effect. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, when will HAC comments be available and will they be available on the website? They will be available on the website. I hesitate to promise a date. Uh, you have here the two people who are going to be working on them, Stephen and Leslie. <laughs> and, um, but we haven't, uh, I don't, I, I just, I can't promise exactly when, hopefully several days before the 14th. Okay, great, thank you. There was a question earlier asked about rescinding funds, and Gideon um, has 
made a statement. He's saying that if they want to rescind funds, they will not extend FY17 funds. Okay, so that so is how it will affect FY17 funding. So that so thank would you, Gideon. fiscal 17 spending if they're expecting to rescind the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions percolating out there? I'm going to give them another few seconds. Sometimes you have to figure it out and then uh, type it out. Okay, I don't see any further questions coming in through our Q&A box. Um, Leslie, Stephen, do you want to have any closing remarks or any other additional information other than advising folks that the presentation along with both uh, Stephen and Leslie's contact information will be provided? We do have a few more questions coming in. Um, let's see. Michelle out at RCAC says that she noticed in an article today that Ben Carson wants to rename HUD to include their mission towards rural housing, but it looked as though their rural housing program was zeroed out also. Um, is this another move to try to combine uh, the housing program? As far as the article, I think Les and I would have to take a look at that. We haven't seen that today unless you have, so we'd be interested in seeing any of that. And we have heard, you know, lots of talk over the, the years of consolidation of USDA and HUD housing programs, both multifamily and single family. And there's been reports off and on every year about that. Um, this budget, uh, and Leslie may have a slightly different opinion here. It's kind of there's not much to consolidate if it kills a lot of the program. I mean, I, I really do mean that. Uh, on the USDA side, it just eliminates the programs. I guess you could, and the, the language often says that uh, you know, the, the state government and basically devolves it from the federal government, so to speak. So I wouldn't view it often as much as a consolidation as I would elimination in a lot of cases in this proposal. The um, GAO, which is now called the Government Accountability Office, has mentioned a couple of in a couple of reports over the last 10 or so years that USDA and HUD might for um, streamlining purposes might look at combining some of their programs and they've singled out the guarantee programs on the grounds that USDA's guarantee programs look uh, somewhat like the FHA programs so if USDA's rural housing programs were going to be focused almost completely on the guarantee programs, I suppose that might give somebody fuel to say this is what should happen. The, gov the budget itself doesn't say that. And we certainly haven't heard, we're not aware of anyone in this administration having taken a position on it one way or the other. Okay, thank you. And we do have a question from Janiqua. And so, yes, Janiqua, the slideshow will be available on HACS website shortly following the end of the webcast. Um, are there any additional questions out there? All right. Um, having seen nothing come through here in the last few minutes, um, want to just Really quick reminder before we wrap up, uh, recording and materials will be available on HACS website. Please also be on the lookout for an email containing the link to your certificate of participation as well as a link to the webinar survey. This is the way that you um, let HACS know that we are delivering the most appropriate content for your organization as well as your activities. I'd like to thank both Leslie and Stephen for their quick work and thorough review and information that's been provided for today's webinar, and also thank each of you for joining us. Um, let's see, one final question before we go. Um, what kind of advocacy should 
people do to change this budget proposal or the budget proposal? What's recommended? Uh, Congress is where the next steps take place. So that would be particularly um, members of Congress who and senators who are members of the appropriations committees, but not exclusively those because everybody will vote eventually. What I'll add there is that in doing this over quite a few years, we often, a lot of folks, uh, it's really the hard work of showing folks on the ground, congressional staff, baby steps to show folks the impact of these programs. If you care about these programs, let folks see back home how it works. And Moises Lowe's, our executive director's statement on our website, really, really reflects that. He says, you know, go, go, it's important now more than ever to really get in the trenches and show folks how these programs work in their communities. It's that simple. And even if you can't get a member of Congress to come and tour your properties or attend a groundbreaking or something like that, um, get their staff, their local staff, because they can have a big impact. There's another right. webinar, I think, maybe tomorrow or next week, the, uh, or maybe it was this afternoon. The um, camp, uh, CHN Coalition, camp, for Coalition for Human Needs, thank you, and the Low Income Housing Coalition, I believe, um, are doing a webinar on what advocates can do. I, we can post that link on our site. I'll have to go check the details of who's, who's putting that on and when and where. Michelle out at RCAC says that it's the Low Income Coalition and it's on May 31st. Thank you. Thank you. So their website is nlihc.org. All right. So with no additional questions coming in, Leslie, Stephen, one last opportunity to make closing remarks. Uh, I'll just say that HACC obviously will keep following all of this and we report on whatever we know about on our website and in the HACC News newsletter. I should probably put in a plug for the fact that the HACC News distribution process is changing and everyone who's been getting the HACC News, the newsletter that comes out every two weeks, if you've been getting it by email, you need to sign up again or you will stop getting it after May 30th. And there's a link in the last couple issues of the Hack News itself and of course on our website to the page where you need to go to sign up again. We don't intend to make it difficult for you. It, it's just this will be a better distribution process for us. All right, having uh, Leslie have the last word, want to thank Leslie and both Stephen again um, for their work here on today's webinar, and also like to thank each of you for joining us today for the webinar, and wish you a happy rest of your afternoon. Thank you, folks. Goodbye.